Thank you everyone for watching this presentation today and to Jade Herniak and Society for Archaeological Sciences for the invitation to present this research. My research investigates imperialism through understanding the organization of production for archaeological pottery. Pottery is the most ubiquitous artifact found in many places around the world, and it can also tell us a good deal about the people that made and used it. The organization of production in particular can inform on, on a society's structure, on how knowledge and technology is transmitted in that society, on gender roles and kinship, on the control and movement of raw materials, resources, and goods, and on structural inequality in the past. Investigating the organization of production for pottery requires considering a finished vessel as the culmination of a series of decisions made by the potter through the entire production process. This includes the acquisition of raw material, the processing of raw materials, for example, is the clay levigated, are any tempers, aplastics added or removed from the clay, the forming and construction of the pot, how is it built or assembled, in what sequence, what techniques or tools are used in this process, surface finishing and decoration, is it slipped, is it burnished, incised, stamped, painted, what are the slips or paints made of, and what sequence are they added to the pottery, and finally firing, what type of environment is it fired in, how hot was the fire? What's the fuel that was used? A potter may not be cognizant of all possible choices at every step in the production process. The choices made by the potter are informed by the potter society and the environment in which the potter learned how to make the pottery. Many of these choices are not visible on the finished product and to replicate them, a learner must be present during the production process. Potters can copy elements like form or decoration from a finished product using their own technologies, and the resultant pottery is similar in outward appearances but technologically distinct. As a result, boundaries between different groups of potters making pottery can be visible through the study of the production process and reconstructing the choices that potters made at these different steps, even when pottery is outwardly similar or indistinguishable in its appearance and decoration. My research applies this idea to the Inca Empire, which at its height in the late horizon, around 1400 to 1532 CE, controlled 2 million square kilometers in Andean South America and had an estimated 12 million subjects. The empire grew out of its capital in Cusco to encompass territory in present-day Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. The Inca developed a number of strategies to control this vast and diverse empire, including the production of rituals and ceremonies and other state-sponsored events in the provinces that promoted imperial control. These events use material culture and imperial styles, including textiles, metal objects, and pottery for their production. Inca pottery was made in a limited number of forms with a standard suite of designs, and only a few of these forms are found in the provinces, vessels primarily used for serving, plates, bowls, and a long neck pointed bottom container called an urpu, uh, used for serving a maize beer called chicha, which was an integral part of many Inca feasts and activities. It's also sometimes called an arribolo. The Inca required subjects to give tribute to the empire in labor, and this requirement included skilled artisans like potters. The Inca also relocated some groups of potters and other artisans away from their traditional homelands to other subject territories to produce objects that serve state needs full time. The Inca invested heavily in places of ceremonial or religious importance to use the influence of these places and their rights to promote state power and control. One such place was Pachacamac on Peru's central coast about 30 kilometers south of present-day Lima. Pachacamac was an important pilgrimage destination and the home of a widely consulted oracle. The Inca transformed the landscape of Pachacamac, creating a number of buildings and spaces, including the Temple of the Sun, which was described by Spanish chroniclers as the second most important religious structure in the entire empire after the Sun Temple in the capital of Cuzco. Pachacamac has also been investigated archaeologically for over a century. My research uses museum collections from historic excavations at multiple places around Pachacamac, including the Temple of the Sun, uh, to investigate the organization of production of Inca pottery there. In my research, I analyzed mul multiple decorative styles of Inca pottery present at Pachacamac. Uh, polychrome, which was originated in the Inca capital of Cusco and is the most um, iconic Inca pottery style. Uh, blackware, from which originated on the north coast and is adapted from pottery styles of the Chimu Empire, which 
the Inca subjugated and whose pottery were frequently relocated across the empire, along with other regional Inca styles. Um, and I also analyzed local styles of pottery that were made by peoples at Pachacamac before, during, and after Inca conquest. In analyzing this pottery, I seek to address the question, how was the production of Inca pottery at Pachacamac organized? Were local potters at Pachacamac required to make imperial styles of pottery uh, used in events that reinforced their subjugation? Was this pottery made by subject potters from other regions that were forcibly relocated to Pachacamac? Was the pottery at Pachacamac imported from other Inca centers? I employed several different archaeometric techniques to investigate this question. Using neutron activation analysis conducted at the University of Missouri Research Reactor, I examined the elemental composition for a subsample of 210 ceramics, including both Inca and local styles of pottery, to better understand the choices potters made about raw material selection. Using this technique for pottery, the slips in any surfaces are removed uh, and the paste, clays, and aplastics together are homogenized. I identified three distinct compositional groups. The first group contains all of the local pottery and Inca styles of pottery, including plates and bowls. The second group contains only Inca pottery. No local styles are present, um, and primarily plates, though bowls and urpus are also present in this group. The third and final group contains only Inca pottery as well, and is almost entirely comprised of the urpu form that's used for serving the maize beer chicha. I compared these data against data that were collected at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the 1950s and 60s. These data came from Inca pottery uh, that were collected at sites further inland in the Lorene River Valley where Pachacamac is located. I found some similarities between these data and data from Pachacamac, indicating a relationship between Inca pottery from Pachacamac and other places in the region. I also compared the data from Pachacamac with data collected at LBNL from the Inca capital of Cusco, which is 500 kilometers away in the highlands. None of the groups identified from, Pachacamac, from the Pachacamac data had any compositional similarity to the pottery from Cusco, though some outliers may have originated there. Other compositional studies in Inca pottery have shown that most pottery was made locally or regionally, and a small amount um, only is imported uh, or moved long distances, and this appears to be the case at Pachacamac. In addition to neutron activation analysis, I have used thin section petrography to analyze an overlapping subsample of 176 ceramics. This technique allows for the identification of minerals present and can also inform on forming techniques and firing. Using both plane and cross polarizing light, I have identified two main larger groups of pottery. The first has sand, perhaps deliberately added as temper, uh, seen here, and this is also present in local styles of pottery analyzed with this method. The second group is poorly sorted, with large and small aplastics both present. Several waster sherds that are indicative of local production of pottery, ones that didn't fire quite right or something, uh, that were analyzed use this method. Also, different mineralo mineralogical profiles appear within this larger group, one with intrusive igneous minerals, including diorite and tonalite, and then another with extrusive igneous minerals, including rhyolite and dacite. I believe that this difference indicates potters using the same technology, at least at the step of raw material processing, uh, using two different sources of raw material. And not all ceramics fall within these two groups, uh, and some are likely imported, like this one, which has an andesite temperature, temper, which is typical of Inca pottery in Cusco. Another technique I employed to examine the forming and construction of pottery is X-radiography performed at the Center for the Analysis of Archaeological Materials at the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. I examined whole vessels, uh, whole urpus from Pachacamac and also some local vessels, um, and found that the urpus are made with very different forming techniques. The urpus at Pachacamac are primarily mold made in a negative mold, um, and you can see the interior finger impressions pushing the clay into the mold. But some urpus are scraped even on the interior, seen by the drag marts from inclusions here. Um, some urpus are made with molds that contain the bases um, along with the bodies, and others are made with uh, bases separately. Bases are typically made in a negative mold as well and are rarely scraped or smooth. You can sort of see the uneven um, 
sur interior surface of the bases. Necks appear always to be made separately from the bodies, uh, and they're also made with a finer paste than the bodies are. You can sort of see the, the inclusions in the radiography. The methods for attaching the necks to the bodies varies, um, as do other details of the construction. These techniques do not align with different styles of Inca pottery. Not all polychrome or blackware herbs are made using any one technique. Finally, I used laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry at the University of Missouri Research Reactor to investigate pigment composition of black and white pigments from Inca and local styles of pottery. I found that black pigments on Inca pottery from all three groups identified using neutron activation analysis um, were compositionally similar. I also found that they were distinct from black pigments uh, used to decorate local styles of pottery. So the black pigments used to decorate Inca pottery are compositionally similar regardless of the paste composition, and they are distinct from those used to decorate local styles. Based on all this data, the picture of organization of production for Inca pottery at Pachacamac becomes clear. Inca pottery was made by multiple groups of potters at Pachacamac, and some of these potters were local, while others were not. Some technologies were shared across groups, like the pigment, pigment composition, while others differed from group to group, and groups also made different decorative styles of Inca pottery, like polychrome or blackware. Groups produced primarily one form, like a plates or urpus or bowls, but did not exclusively produce one form. And finally, some pottery was imported, but most was produced locally. The organization of Inca pottery was, at Pachacamac was complex. The Inca empire mobilized both local artisans and relocated potters to produce pottery which provisioned state-sponsored activities that reinforced their own control and subjugation. Thank you.